Now, he does not force, but he gives you an invitation and an opportunity to come before him. Don't miss the opportunity to come before the presence of the Lord when you have it. Whether that be song, whether that be prayer, or whether that be coming together, don't miss the opportunity to go before God's presence. Yes. You never want to miss the opportunity for you to come in there. Don't, don't, don't get in the routine of sitting in a pew and leaving. That is the equivalent of going to your friend or your parent's house and sitting in a couch and never saying anything. But you leave your parents or your grandparents or whatever's house and you said, at least I was there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you go visit someone, I go because I wanted to spend time with you. In order to spend time with you, that meant I had to say something. Don't come sit on God's couch and not say anything to him. Even if all you say is, I'm just happy to be here one more time. The old people say, you didn't have to let me live. Didn't have to let me be, but I'm glad to be in the service one more time. That was too old for some of you, but Mother Higgins knew what I was saying. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to dismiss our children's point. Our children's point. Lord, our kids' point, I'm all of the source. Kids' point from the ages of 5 through 12. 5 through 12. Anybody love Jesus? Anybody love Jesus? Muriel. Muriel. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So where am I on the program? Where am I? Is this time to preach now, I guess? All right. Anybody feel better now? Anybody feel better? Sometimes we, um, even, even our non-traditional church, we can get in our own routine as well. Or we run right to praise and worship, go right to the word, do all this stuff. Sometimes God, he'll interrupt even what we have planned to show us. There's no God greater than him. And he's more concerned about his people than he is about our program. So I want to say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You don't have to stay anymore. I want to thank those of you all. Before I go, I say thank you all the time. Not because I don't have anything else to say. But I thank you because some of you, that's the first time you've ever experienced anything like that before. You've never seen somebody interrupt the service. But I thank you for participating in them. Even if you just sat there and, and, and respected the atmosphere. I, mean, I, I respect you. Thank you that you didn't walk out or leave or anything like that. Uh, that you didn't feel that anything spooky was going on. We try to explain everything that's happening, going on. Uh, we just believe um, that uh, even though they celebrated Ghost yesterday, we always welcome the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yes. He doesn't need a season or a month. And he doesn't even need an outfit. He just shows up. So I thank you for allowing the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to uh, stay in the room. All right? I'm not going to ask you to stay anymore. We're going to go ahead into our new series. Hallelujah. In the remaining times that I have, uh, Matthew, the ninth chapter, verse 35. We're in a series called The Harvest. We're going to talk about the harvest all month. I'm so glad that, that you're back in your right seat this time. You're not with your mother where you were last time. Thank you for being in your right seat. Uh, every, I'm telling you all, um, even if we're in a new church, everybody already claims what pew they sit on. So people sit in certain places, and when they move, I'm like, you don't normally sit on that side. Uh, so one of our um, great supporters sat with her mom one day, which was totally fine, but she was on the wrong pew, and it threw me off. So uh, but so glad she got right at her spot, and she's sitting the same way she always sits. <laughs> Just like this. So I know. Scripture says the shepherd knows their sheep. So Matthew 9, chapter, verse 35. Um, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, <clears throat> proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them uh, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And verse 36 again, it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. Someone say compassion. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Verse 37 says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, 
But the workers, in one verse it says, the laborers are few. 38 says, as the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 37 again says that he to send his disciples. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We're talking about harvest. He said the harvest is plentiful, meaning as I always talk about harvest, verse 38 says, As the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Send out workers. Someone said workers. He said send out workers. Did you say send out members? And I think it's real interesting. And because we, we think, many of us, not you, just me, me, myself, we think many times that this is the work. I showed up. We think this, that's it. That's all it is. I did my devotion this morning. That's it. I'm sitting in the back this week, still at the front. And I want them to call me out. That's it. <laughs> We think that's it. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. So today I want to talk about this subject. Work your field. Work your field. Can you repeat? Tell, why don't you tell three people that? Say, work your field. 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 Okay, go to the next slide real quick. I want to show y'all this real quick and then we'll come back. You know, a lot of people enjoy going to go pick out plants, what they want, because uh, you can look at different plants and see right now what they look like. Uh, and in harvest time, it's time to uh, grab and just get what's already been planted. But the difference in getting something that's already blown versus a seed is that you have to trust the seed to produce into something like that. Everywhere he went. 
Everywhere Jesus went, Jesus went for the purpose of making an impact. Jesus never went anywhere because he had nothing else to do. Everywhere Jesus went, he wanted to make an impact. It says Jesus went to the towns, he went into the villages, he was teaching in the synagogues, and he was healing every type of disease everywhere he went. That meant that there was a result everywhere Jesus went. Why did that just happen a few minutes ago? Because Jesus wanted you to know that when he shows up, he heals sicknesses, he heals diseases, he changed minds, he regulates issues, he starts lifting up burdens, he lets you know that he is God. There is no God greater than our God. I keep saying that, and the reason that I'm saying it is because the pastor has made it seem that there's no God greater than the pastor. So we have made it as if the pastor controls what happens. The pastor controls what goes on in the church. The pastor controls the atmosphere. The pastor shows what happens up next. But God has to interrupt our schedule to let us know that you're on my program, boy. You're on my program, church. There is nobody that's greater than me. That is why he has given Jesus a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, Yeshua, the name of the anointed one, every knee shall bow. Someone say impact. Yeah. So here it is 
in verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed, they were helpless, and they were like sheep without a shepherd. Why did he have compassion on them? Did he have compassion on them because they were sick? Did he have compassion on them because they had diseases? No, it said he had compassion on them because they were helpless. He had compassion on them because they were harassed. Has there anybody in this church, and I'm not doing a poll or a survey, but I am. Is there anybody in this church who you've ever been raised in church or been in church and felt harassed? When you come into the presence of God, come into church feeling like it's supposed to be a safe place, but it seems over time to be the last place you want to go. You get into church and you feel more judged in the church than you feel even out there in the streets. You are all you're trying to do is do the best you can. All you're trying to do is live the best you can. You're not selling anymore. Right, right. You're not out there doing anything bad. You're not, you're not angry. You're not doing anything. You're only trying to be in his presence and people make you feel like you're in the wrong place. Since Jesus had compassion on them because they were harassed. Now understanding this is the reason that I said this. The next thing I want uh, to know is that Jesus had compassion for souls. The reason that these people were harassed is because the Pharisees had been teaching them the law. But they had not taught them love. They had taught them rules. They had taught them routine. They had taught them church etiquette. They had taught them what it looks like to be anointed. They had taught them what would get you what you need to get. They taught you how to dress. They taught you when to say amen. They taught you when to say how They taught you all the mosaic laws and all the different ceremonial things. We don't eat pork. We don't do this. We only worship on the Sabbath. All, they do all the rules. We do all the feasts. They did everything according to the mosaic laws. But they didn't have love. So they had all the routine down. We don't eat before sun up. We only eat when sun goes down. All the mosaic things. We did all these different things according to the law, and they learned it according to the tea, but they didn't have love. So Jesus comes on the scene and he has compassion for them because they were displaced. Have you ever did all the rules? and still feel displaced? Have you ever gone through the routine and still feel out of place? And still feel out of order? Well, they told me if I do this, then it's going to happen. But it still didn't happen. They told me that this week was going to be the week. They told me that if I sold this much into the church, that God would take care of my house. And that didn't work. Because they showed you how to do the rules and the routine. And many times, help me Jesus, many times the rules were not from God. The rules were from men. Many times the rules were not to glorify God. The rules were to glorify my control issue. Many times the rules were designed to make sure I can keep control over your destiny. It was not for God. <laughs> so they learned the rules but they were surrounded by people who didn't care for them my next point is don't pretend to care if you don't so here it is the Pharisees were walking around acting like shepherds who were not you know the Lord wants you to do this the Lord wants you to do this the Lord wants you to do this but they didn't care for the people they just wanted them to follow their rules if you follow my rules, then you'll do it. If you follow my rules, you'll be in good standing with me. Do not connect with people who are only interested in their own self-benefit. I don't have to make y'all clap. It was good. I clap for myself. Some of y'all looking at me trying to be convinced. I'm trying to tell you, I know it's good. I clap for myself. Praise the Lord. Preach tomorrow. I think I will. So what I'm saying is, he said, don't be concerned because there's a whole lot of people who only love you when they do when you do what they want you to do. As long as you perform for them, as long as you do what you want them to do, as long as you show up when they want you to show up, as long as you cook what they want you to cook, they love you. But as soon as you stop doing what they want you to do, then they 
excuse from loving you. So don't pretend to love me if you don't. Don't pretend to care for me when all you want is something from me. There are more harassed and displaced church members and saints and people out there in the field because of us pretending like we care and we don't. Because really my care was really cooked and I wanted to get you long enough so our ties could go up. I had a ministry that needed a leader so I needed you to serve. I don't care for you. I don't care anything about your house. I don't care nothing about your marriage. I just want you to do what I want you to do and do it and let God bless it. He'll worry about your house later on. But you bless his house, he'll take care of yours. We say these things. We say these churchy things. And I'm going to do a series about that one day. The lies they told me. But anyhow, we say these things. All these churchy stuff. Y'all want me to preach it right now? Anyhow, all these churchy stuff that we say, you take care of God's house, he'll take care of yours. And it makes you cry. And it sounds right. And it makes you sound like, well, i got a heart of serving. Yes, it sounds good. But God had compassion on everybody who was harassed. Everywhere Jesus went, he was healing people. How do I know that service is not always the key? Because there was a sister. There are two sisters. And one sister decided to sit at Jesus' feet. Another sister was working. And she said, Jesus, what do you have to say about this woman who just wants to sit before your feet all the time? He said, I honor the fact that you want to work. But she has chose the more needful thing. Because there's always going to be work to do. But I'm not always going to be around you. Yeah. There's always work to do. But he's not always there like that. So what I'm saying for you goes back to praise and worship. When his manifest presence comes, you're going to always have Monday through Saturday to work. But don't miss an opportunity to say, God, I just love you. God, I just praise you. God, I know my feels for tomorrow, but right now, God, I love you. I thank you for caring for me. Never miss an opportunity to just say, God, I'm here. Yes. God, I'm here. Yes. So he said, Martha, it's fine that you want to work, but don't think that your working is going to get you closer to me. Thank you, Jesus. My tongue's almost up. So the teachers were pretending to be shepherds when they were not. Verse 37 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers or the laborers are few. Third thing, last point here, is that Jesus knew his field. Jesus not only had compassion on people, Jesus not only reached out to people, but he knew his field. What does it mean to know his field? He says, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Verse 38 says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers in his harvest field. Why am I saying this? And I'm ending here. Why is this important? And why are we talking about harvest? Because all of you are connected to a field. All of you are connected to something and to somebody. Everywhere Jesus went, he had impact, Jesus had compassion, and Jesus knew his field. Yeah. Some of you keep trying to get people to church, but they're not coming to church because you haven't met them in the field. Right. I'm trying to get them to come to Broke Point so they can experience it. But they're saying, I'm experiencing your field every day and you never speak to me. Yeah. He's a little edgy. He doesn't like, we don't know what they do. He doesn't wear suits all the time. Sometimes he does when he thinks he's cute. But you know, he does different things. But I want you to come experience the pastor. But I'm saying to you that I've never heard you even say Jesus. And you're right here in my field. And you're trying to invite me to church that starts at 1 o'clock? Really? <laughs> And you want to convince me to come at 1 o'clock for a church that's only six months? Shoot, girl, whatever. Child, whatever. Really? But you never have ministered to me in this field? You've never even shared a Bible app with me. 
I hear you listen to Waka Flocka. Ooh. I've never heard you listen to Chris Tomlin. I've never heard you listen to Levi. I've never heard you listen to Myron Butler. I've never heard you listen to Kirk Franklin. And you talking about come to your church to worship with you, but you've never worshiped with me on our lunch break. Because you say, when I tried to sit at the table last time, you said this is the only time I had for peace. So don't, I don't let anybody sit here. So I saw you sitting there with the Bible, but you never even offered to explain it to me. So why do you think I'm going to come to your church and you haven't met me in the field yet? Why would I come to a place I don't even know if I'm, I'm I don't even know if it's real yet because I hadn't heard about it in the city yet. But I have known you for 15 years. And you never reached me. So why do you think your, power, your pastor has more influence than you do? Why do you think the praise team is going to make me lift my hands and I've never seen you lift your hands, ever? Actually, the last time I, you know what, I did see you lift your hands. The last time I saw you lift your hands, you hit somebody. So you want to lift up holy hands in church, but anger hands here in the field? You want to lift up holy hands in church, but your tweets are nasty. You want to lift up holy hands in the church, but I see you slander everybody that goes to your church that you want me to come to. I feel like I already know them because of what you say about them. And you want me to come to your church? Yeah. But you haven't worked my field yet. Did you know that I lost my child? Why you being so deep and spiritual? Did you offer to pray for me? Did you offer to help? Did you even bring chicken to my house? You trying to invite me to church, but I'm right here in your field and you haven't even reached me. I got 30 seconds left. He says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the field. My last point is, don't allow your influence to become stale. All of you here at Growth Point, we have changed our wording. We're not looking for members. We're looking for leaders. Thank you. Somebody had to say something. Somebody. We don't need leaders. We don't need members. We need leaders. What are leaders? You have a field. You're connected to a field, and every leader has influence. What are you leading in your field? Do you have more gossip groups? Do you have more angry groups? What would riding in the car with you look like? What would going to, what would going to Cheesecake Factory look like for you on Saturdays? After we've done our little hi, how you doing? Hallelujah. After we got through doing that, what's really in your heart? Right. What would it really look like? There was a guy who met with me this week and I was so angry that I had to pray. There's a guy who met with me this weekend. Not, no, not this one. I had two meetings. I had to clarify it because one guy's going to think it was him and one him. There's another guy I met with. I'm sorry, I had to clarify it. It seemed like what? It's the first time I've heard it. But there was a guy I met with the other day at, um, what's that place you took me to? Nukes. Nukes in front of the mall. And he started coming to this church because of a leader of the church. I'm not, I'm not talking about a member, a leader of the church. A person had influence of their field invited him. And he told me he hasn't been going to church anymore. And I said, why won't you go to church? And how did you get to grow up on? Why did you come? He said, well, I heard there was this new guy. He was young. The church started. All the typical stuff people say. You know, it's young. It's new. It's not church as usual. All that stuff. And I said, yeah, I want to come. So I came. And I said, well, why did you stop going to church? He said, because the last time I went to church, I decided after the pastor got through preaching that I was going to leave because I had to go to work. When I was going out the door, 
the usher, which happened to be the pastor's son, looked at me and said, where are you going? And I said, I got to leave and go to work. He said, church ain't over. And I said, well, he's through preaching. Can I leave? He still tried to go out the door. The pastor's son, who was an usher, took him, lifted him up, and put him up against the wall and said, you leave when I tell you something. And he said, I haven't been back to church ever since. Now that bothers you, doesn't it? It bothered me. But it bothers God when you have people in your field and you look over them. It bothers God the things that we do to people because we think they're not ready for in here. They might not be ready for church yet, but they are ready for your field. So what they haven't got over weed? So what they smell still smell? So what they don't know what to say? But they're in your field. It bothers God when you're roughing up his people. It bothers God because it said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that there may be workers in his field. His field means he planted them. So how dare you rough up somebody, put them up against the wall, and say, you leave when I want you to leave. Who are you? Yeah. Who are you? That you messed up somebody. He, this guy, could have never given God a chance ever again because of one person. But glory to God that there was somebody in this church who said, try it one more time. Yes, we're around, radical and strange, and people do look at me strange, but for whatever reason, he comes and he says, I feel like I belong here. Yeah. Not only that, this. <laughs> this same guy that this usher roughed up told me at news. I've been running from my car. I feel God has called me to preach. But I didn't feel worthy until I came to your church. So one person rubbed him up. Another person said, I see you in the field. I see you in the field. And I'm coming after you. And you, who's in your field that you're looking over? People that you're connected to, I don't care that they get on your nerves. They matter to God. And if they matter to God, they matter to us. What are you doing with the people in your field? What are you doing with the people in your field? Clap your hands. This whole month, we're dedicated to souls. We're always going to have church, but I'm more concerned about people's lives. This whole month, when we talk about harvest, because the first thing the Lord gave me the harvest, I said, Lord, everybody's going to talk about, it. yeah, my, my ship's coming in. My breakthrough's coming in. He said, no, I don't want you to talk about that. I want you to talk about all the people that live around that they haven't recognized you. Yeah, that's so good, that's harvest. It's always people around you that need Jesus. Do you hear me? I love Billy Graham. Billy Graham has gone off the scene, but the Billy Graham never had an organ. Don't you might know Billy Graham? Billy Graham never had an organ. He never had a big praise team. He had the same song sang at every altar call. Just as I am without one, but that the blood was shed for me, and that the bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Had nothing.
nothing, no key changes, no nothing. For however many years, over thousands of people came to know Jesus because of one man. I remember the first Billy Graham crusade I went to was in Louisville, Kentucky. And I remember sitting there and uh, there was this big gap in between of the stage. Like the chairs were all the way back and the stage was way in front. I sat there and I said, why don't they put chairs down in the front? That's me. I'm being a band planner. I'm like, the chairs need to be in the front. I got this big hole up there. It seemed like it would look better. And I said, I asked one of the ushers. It, it irritated me. So I asked one of the ushers. I said, you think they're going to put some chairs up in the front? And he said, uh, he, he didn't get mad at me. He said, no, sir. I said, well, why? He said, well, that's by design. I said, who's? He said, Billy Graham. I said, why? And he said, well, that's called the God Gap. I said, what's the God Gap? He said, he believes that if he points people to Jesus, God will fill that gap when he gets to preach. And every time that man got through preaching, people would come out of the stands and walk down and fill the entire gap. I'm asking God for you to fill your gap. That God would fill the gap that you're scared of. The people that you feel can't be reached. This month, November, ask God. Come on, everyone, lift your hands right now and say this. Say, God, fill my gap. Say it again. Say, God, fill my gap. Fill it with souls. Fill it with my family. Fill it with my friends. And even God, fill it with my enemies. In Jesus' name. Choose and say, I 